telling me, he said, there's a lot of times you can throw out the word Christian, and I'm a Christian and use it in a, in a political way. He just said, I'm not interested in that. Uh, he said, our country needs God. He said, I need more God. I need revival. We all just need revival. And I praise God for that. And uh, so uh, you will enjoy getting to meet him. So Dr. Rowland, you come. Thank you, Pastor Washer. It's uh, great to be with you today. I, uh, I regret that Mike Pelletier can't be here, but I hear his family is here. Uh, if you're here, raise your hand. I need to know who to address all of this to today. <laughs> Over here. And then who else? Anybody else? Okay, good. Well, uh, I'll tell you, he has meant a lot to, to, to me and uh, in my life. He started coming to my dad's church whenever I was in high school. So uh, he's had a profound influence on my life, and, uh, and, and it's, I'm grateful to be in his, his home church here. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. You know, you don't wake up one morning and decide to run for president. Um, they say there's really only one reason to do it, and if you're crazy or corrupt. And, uh, and I discovered that there was a third reason, and, and you would not have been able to convince me of it until it happened to me, but that is if you're called. And I'll tell you, I think the more you hear, the more you see of where the world is, where America is, and what God wants to do in this country, and what God can do if we will let Him, uh, you will understand exactly why I'm running, uh, and I believe with the favor, blessing, and anointing of Almighty God. Uh, you know, when I ran for the Senate in Montana in 2012, I lost by 60-some votes. I needed 33 votes to win, and I did not want to recount because I didn't really want to be the senator. I was trying to see if I could brand a person the way I did products because uh, I was used to running companies and being a CEO of companies, and so um, it was more of a challenge than, than something that I really had a heart and passion for. And it also showed me and taught me that I never, ever wanted to run for politics or for a public office. I really thought I would just be a, 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 an ambassador. Uh, in fact, uh, that's what I expected, something where I could just represent the United States. I did not have to get into the partisanship of it all. Uh, and I could just uh, talk about the merits of the United States. And so, you know, a lot of my journey, whenever I transitioned from the corporate world into uh, the world of diplomacy, uh, involved a lot of that. In 2017, I was uh, speaking in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing, China, uh, on the U.S.-China trade war. I was supposed to be able to talk about anything I wanted, and I had. Uh, uh, and then the day before, I flew out. I was supposed to speak to, and address the assembly, uh, the Communist Party, uh, that Wednesday. I was flying out on Monday morning, and on Sunday morning, I got a text. I was literally in church, and I got a text that. Uh, they wanted me to change my topic to the U.S.-China trade war. So I texted a U.S. senator who, who was on the Foreign Relations Committee, and I said, they want me to do this. I do not want to start World War III. President Trump was meeting President Xi Jinping for the first time that Saturday, and uh, I thought, man, this is a setup if I've ever seen one. <laughs> and so, uh, so I texted him when we were on the phone that afternoon with the State Department. And anyway, it all, uh, they, they gave the green light for me to go ahead, and they were, we were all kind of in the loop there. And, uh, but going from there to, to doing some things in Spain and then doing the things in, uh, in Africa has really been an amazing journey. Of course, our heart was for helping the people of Africa on mission, specifically as it relates to clean water initiatives. Uh, and of course, because of Mark 941, it was really just the amazing entree with that we had some, some clean water technology that they didn't have access to. And uh, so we were able to kind of show the love of God and really the, the water uh, so that you'll never thirst again. And so it's just always a beautiful picture. So that was our main uh, emphasis and focus, still is there. And then also education. Uh, like in Malawi, for example, 69% illiteracy rate, uh, which is the major reason why they are so suppressed economically outside of you know, corruption and uh, mismanagement and so forth. But uh, so we wanted to have literacy uh, courses, and so we created uh, the Roland College to have the School of Entrepreneurship, Kingdom Business and Kingdom Entrepreneurship. You can learn about business from any, you know, anywhere in the world. Turn on, you know, turn on YouTube or l go to any little seminar, and you'll, you'll start learning accounting and marketing and, uh, you know, product positioning and so forth. But what you can't teach and what you can't find information on is kingdom business, how to do business God's way, entrepreneurship. 
uh, being led of the Lord, the way our whole lives are supposed to be. And so, uh, so we really emphasized and focused on that in our School of Business and Entrepreneurship in our School of Literacy. In uh, 2022, last year, we graduated 2,451 students, uh, African students, so we're very grateful for that uh, on the continent. Uh, and then, of course, I've been a, 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 on the U.S. China, uh, let's see here, U.S. delegation to South Sudan uh, the last couple of years with six Congress people, three ambassadors, U.S. ambassadors and me. And uh, that, you know, South Sudan is the world's newest nation. We gave birth to them. The United States did 11 years ago. We separated Sudan. Uh, and it's very difficult when you have spent generations uh, having children in order to fight. So, for example, the reason you're allowed to have, some tribes you're allowed to have ten wives, some seven wives, some five wives. The reason you're allowed, Dinkas, I think, is five wives and the other tribe is ten. Uh, but the reason they have, are allowed to take so many wives uh, is because, so you can have more babies and you need to have more men because it's a dishonor if you live to 30 years old because you clearly didn't fight enough for your tribe uh, to be in power and so forth. So, culturally, you come in and try to create a free country and they're used to shooting each other if there's a disagreement. Uh, as opposed to how do we how do we handle this judicially uh, judiciously how do we handle this you know well first of all there has to be laws well who gets to decide the laws uh, and so and then who's going to implement the laws and what can you arrest someone for and you know what's the process and what's the kind of the flow just like you would in your home uh, of, am I just going to do a verbal correction or all the way to, maybe to a spanking or something what, what am, where where's the the gamut here of punishment and so there's a lot to be done. But I can tell you they've made great progress in the last few years. Uh, I was uh, with the delegation there last August, and uh, it was really in my time, that was a big catalyst for me in declaring uh, my candidacy for President of the United States. It's really something, uh, and I'll share a little bit more about that in a moment, but um, uh, it was sitting, we, we found ourselves, the way that we did their constitution is the president's required to have five vice presidents, and the first vice president, the most important vice president, he had to, had to be the opposition leader. So it would be, for example, if we required in the United States President Biden to take President Trump as his vice president, whoever your opponent is, and then we did the other four, okay? And then you expect something to get done, and we're mad at them when they don't harmoniously you know, pass legislation and move forward as a country. And it wasn't just that they were opponents. They were literally shooting at each other with weapons in the bush a month before. So it's a whole different world. It's an impossible world. We have 247 years of practice at being a free nation. They've got 11 years, and we expect higher ideals from them than we do of ourselves, which, unfortunately, in our foreign policy these days is the American way, and it's one of the reasons that I'm running. But I want to read from Matthew 24, uh, verse 6. Let's begin in verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. Well, that's all. Every time we hear about it, everybody starts to worry, don't they? Just fret. and It's amazing. We respond unbiblical to nearly everything in culture, as you find in God's Word. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The end is near, but not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. Oh, you can't imagine some of the famines, the issues. They'll call it climate change in different parts of Africa and what's happening, but it's just famine. It's historical. It always has been. God usually used famines as judgment and pestilences. Well, I, we did just have a uh, semblance of a pandemic. We certainly acted like it was one. Pestilences for sure. And earthquakes. Earthquakes and hurricanes, the amount of damage and the loss of life, it's unbelievable. In divers places all over. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. And shall hate one another. Call this 800 number if you didn't get your shot or if you didn't wear your mask or you didn't do this or that. Betray one another. Just tell on each other. That's what all regimes that end up taking down world empires do. 
And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. It's not just because we're so inundated with so many things and we're so busy. It is because iniquity abounds. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. There is no looking back. It's the same whenever Lot and his family had to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. You don't grab anything, you just get. I tell you, I know this is referring to Israel and the destruction of Jerusalem. I understand that that is the, the end times and, the, and when you know it is, it is here, here. And, uh, but we're, obviously, it's the parallel passage in Luke 21. We're living in the last days, but it's not yet. But we know what signs of the times are, and we know that we are here. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a war on God in America. We live in a day of great spiritual warfare against the church and people of God. I, I told several mega church pastors during COVID, in fact, I, the first one was in June of 2020. A lot of the lockdowns hadn't even, well, the lockdowns had started in March, end of March. And, um, and then the mass mandates came in that June. And I was doing some, some services, logistics for some folks on the COVID White House task force uh, beginning in March uh, uh, when it happened, March around March 19th is when I started. And I literally stopped and resigned that April 20th within one month because of the conversations that I found myself in. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. People are going to go to jail for this. I was wrong about that part, but I wasn't wrong that people usually go to jail about those kind of things. And I remember thinking to myself, this is the kind of stuff that movies come out about 20, 30 years from, uh, from now and says based on a true story. I just didn't want to be in that film. And so I resigned. They sent me the flag that flew above the Capitol on May 20th, 2020, May 22nd, 2020, and thanked me for my service. And that was it. <laughs> and then who, I could not have even imagined it would go on another couple of years. But I say this because there's a great spiritual warfare against the church. And obviously, as you know, regardless of what happened and what is and what is not, we know the commands of Scripture. And for churches, so many churches bowed the knee. And I said, I told a couple of these mega church pastors, one in Africa, a couple in the United States, I said, you can never preach on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ever, ever again with any kind of integrity. Because you said to not bow the knee, uh, to, that they should not have bowed the knee and resisted the, the order from the king uh, to bow down to the image of the state. And instead, uh, and you championed that, but then we didn't do it. Uh, and ironically, we praise Christians in China who, who violate the law of their land by attending church every week. And we read missionary letters and we praise this. Uh, and then, but they're risking their life and we're risking, you know, a, vir a, a cold, a flu, uh, a wh what have you. I just, it's interesting to understand. And here's what you must know. That's just the appetizer. That wasn't even the real pandemic. That's coming. This, what, this, this wasn't, uh, this was a test. If you, I really just, the best way is an appetizer. You're just, we're just getting warmed up. That's why you have to have people leading this nation that seek God. We don't rule by our own wisdom. We don't rule by man's wisdom and what you think. In fact, Proverbs tells us in many times, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The problem is most of us lead our lives by what we think is right, not by what he says is right. And people say, well, there's no way you could have known. Well, then how did some of us know? Obviously, we could. You just didn't. See, and that's the way it is in every issue after issue when you get your counsel from God's Word. We used to have leaders that exercised sound biblical wisdom. Uh, we used to have presidents that were just as proficient in prayer as they were in policy. But we are in a time of great spiritual warfare against the church and the people of God. The fabric of our nation, the nuclear family, children, 
are being attacked and desecrated. America needs God. Our economy is in shambles with the de-dollarization, hyperinflation, and out-of-control debt. America needs God. Our national security is threatened like never before. China is surpassing us as a world superpower. BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, the BRICS, seeks to counteract every aspect of American uh, dominance, replacing our currency, many of our trade agreements, in order to weaken our influence. We are fighting wars, simultaneous and parallel, on many fronts, spiritual wars, culture wars, economic wars, AI wars, cyber wars, information wars, disinformation wars, psyops wars. America needs God. God gives us clear policy in His Word that builds and destroys nations. I want to give you from God's Word three things that build nations and three things that destroys nations. Three things that build nations. His blueprint is right here. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness is God's guaranteed way of blessing a nation, of building a nation, of exalting a nation. And you know, if you or I or America is ever to be exalted, it must be by the hand of God. He alone can do it. But don't we live in an age where everyone is trying to elevate themselves? Everyone is trying to put themselves out there. Everyone else is trying to exalt themselves. Look at any social media ever all the time, and you see everyone's constantly trying to exalt themselves. I get counsel that I have to shun, rebuke frequently <laughs> because they want me to, to exalt myself. They want me to put myself out there over and over and over. And that's not the game I'm playing. I'm not playing by any of their rules like that. If I am going to be exalted, then God Himself, the hand of God, must do it. And that is because of this verse, Righteousness exalteth a nation. Not your own doing, not your machinations. In fact, how many times does He have to say that whatever you think you're going to do, every trap and well-laid plan you have, you'll fall into it and it will be laid to waste. I don't want my way. I don't want whatever I can think of, dream of, scheme of, I need the blessing and hand of Almighty God, and so does America. Righteousness exalts the nation. So what's righteousness? Well, it's really very simple, and I think most of us know it. We know there's nothing good in us. So the best we do is a heart for Jesus Christ, righteousness, a love, a hunger, and thirst for righteousness, to doing what's right, holy, upright, godly living. You know, a lot of that for me is, you know, making sure your eyes, your eyes, your ears, where you go, what you do, who you're with, what you, the input. Am I living for the Lord? Is He Lord of my life? And by the way, if He's not Lord of everything in your life, is He really Lord at all? That's what Lord is. Americans really don't like to have masters. We don't want anybody lording over us. In fact, we, we mock countries that have that have lords, overseers and lords. We, we mock uh, people who, uh, although that has been what most people have known in past generations, centuries, thousands of years, there's traditionally been a, a pharaoh or a king lording over the subjects. And of course, America, the greatest nation on this earth, there's no doubt, because we are free, you know, you can't talk like this in other countries against your own government. It is illegal. You will be ostracized. And you may be canceled here too, uh, given, you know, many of our corrupt institutions. But this is still the greatest nation on earth. And I believe it's because there's a remnant of people who are still focused on being a righteous people. I mean, a righteous people living holy, righteous before God. Blessings. Number two, righteousness builds a nation. The blessing of the upright will build a nation. Proverbs 11, 11. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. 
By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. So when you study God's word of nations, he says a lot. He says a lot about countries. He says a lot about how to rule countries, how to govern, good governance according to God's word. Can someone write that book for me? (laughs) There's a lot in there. There's about protocol, when to put yourself in front of the presence of the king, when not to. And it's better to, 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 to not put yourself in the presence and to be called up than to be put lower in the presence of the prince, right? I, he says so much about protocol, how to eat at the state dinners. Proverbs, if you be a, man, or be a person given to hunger, it's better to slit your throat than to, than to just overindulge <laughs> in the mill in the presence of the king. That's amazing. I love the Bible. I love how practical and relevant it is. But by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. You know, a couple years ago, we were about to purchase and and we we were in final negotiations with the city of Akron, Ohio, to purchase a campus there. And it was the former Akron Baptist Tabernacle campus, over half a million square feet. And... uh, My wife and I were in Cabo San Lucas, and they called us on a Thursday night, and they said, they they just called me, and they said, they're going to uh, let us, give us the final in the morning, the final go-ahead, it's got the green light. This is Thursday night. The next morning, I'm waiting for the phone call saying it's done. Phone call didn't come, phone call didn't come. And finally, you know, people backed out of deals and things, and it didn't happen. But I took, I had, I, I, I took uh, the, this verse, Proverbs 11, 11. I put it on uh, like canvas and I had it framed enough for the leadership of the city of Akron for them to all put in their offices. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. And I said, the future of this city, the blessing of God on the future of this city is dependent upon how you treat the upright in your city. And this can be a part of it. We want it to be a part of it. We want to resurrect a great ministry here that used to go on for decades in this place. And they ended up passing, stalling. My wife and I drove by there a few months later because we thought, okay, maybe there's a different deal to be had. Maybe we can do a different offer. Maybe we can arrange it a different way. And when we got there, literally it had been vandalized. The windows crashed. I went into a place. I started hearing some noise. There, there were vagrants inside. They had destroyed the, city, the, 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 the ceilings, the roof. It was a stunning, stunning 5,000-seat auditorium. $80,000 Steinway piano just destroyed. And I called the owners right then and I said, do you know? And they said, yes, we know. And, there's not, and the city has said there's nothing they can do about it. I said, you've got probably 100 people living in this place right now, just destroying it, ransacking it. No one's here. They chose. They chose. I'm telling you, by the, if you want your nation to be built By God, you must respect and bless the people of God to have God's blessing upon it. That's one of the main reasons I want to strengthen families, strengthen the home. We celebrate a lot of things in America. Most of it's the wrong things. But I'll tell you what we need to celebrate is families. You know, we need to celebrate homes. We need to celebrate anniversaries. Mine's tomorrow. Really excited about that. That's where I'm going to be with my wife in a few hours. Uh, But, you know, look, we have to strengthen the home. When you strengthen The home. God's ordained three institutions. Government, home, and the church. When when you strengthen the home, when you celebrate husbands and wives that have strong marriages and stay together and grow in grace with each other and with God, when you celebrate and elevate and strengthen that family unit, you are elevating every other people group in America. The problem is when when you decimate and disintegrate The family unit, they do that thinking it raises everyone else up, and it does the opposite. If they want raised up every other people group there is, you don't do it by destroying the family. 
You celebrate, you educate, you encourage, you lift up, you strengthen the home and the family unit. And every other people group is blessed because you have, you have blessed and made important what God made important. Number three, the third thing that builds nations is repentance. Repentance. No more loose living, carnal, self-centered lives, but complete surrender. Complete surrender, sold out, abandoned to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I remember whenever I gave my life to Christ, I trusted Christ as my Savior when I was five years old. But I had not surrendered you know, my life to Christ. I, I ended up growing up, obviously went to Christian school, went to Christian college, colleges. And uh, immediately when I was 18, started investing in real estate and uh, did, did well. And that took me a different journey. Ended up running companies. Wanted to be the CEO of a billion dollar company, and that's all I was laser focused on. Not living for the Lord, not anything else. I was going to be the CEO of a billion dollar company. And I'll tell you, it took its toll. I paid the price and how sick this is, but I was willing to pay whatever price it was. Take my family, take Mary, nothing mattered. It didn't matter. I was going to be the CEO of a billion dollar company. That's what I was going to do. And it was September 15th. 2015, when I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, when I gave Him everything, when I said, it doesn't matter if I'm ever a CEO again the rest of my life. I don't care if I'm never on a, in a magazine again. I don't care if I'm ever interviewed. It does, I'm done. I am done. You have me. All of me. I'm yours. And I did think that was the end of me. And I'll tell you, that is the way it, it did go for a period of time. It's about a year and a half, two years of my life, that was brutally hard. He did take everything. And this was after I surrendered. Took it all. Everything I held dear, my pilot's license, flying private planes, doing whatever the lifestyle, you name it, that was, that was it. Exactly what comes to your mind, that's what I was living. And he took it all. And it was in the middle of that that I told, I remember telling my parents, don't worry about it. I mean, it, it was so bad, it would bring tears to the eyes of a pilgrim. And you know their journey on the Mayflower. It was bad. But I said, don't worry. Because for the first time in my life, it's not punishment. It's the purifying trial, the purifying furnace. He's burning off every bit of Roland that's there so that the only thing that's left is him. And I welcome it. I welcome it. I want it off. I want the dross gone so that the only thing that's there is not some polished, fake, choreographed picture, but the real, authentic man that God wants me to be. Repentance. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, say it with me, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven, will heal their land, forgive their sin. Second Chronicles 7, 14 is the answer. We must repent. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come. At 1 Peter 4, 17, that judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment must begin at the house of God. You know, the key to God sparing and blessing the United States of America has nothing to do with the wicked, godless things that are going on in the world today. Think about that. God never commands whatever wickedness is going on in America for them to just stop. What he commanded, and it goes back to, uh, it has everything to do with you and me. Abraham negotiated with God to save and spare Sodom and Gomorrah. But he didn't say, if, you'll, if all of the bad people will stop doing bad things. Right? If you stop all the wickedness. God didn't make that part of the condition. It was, if, you, if I find ten, 50 righteous people, will you spare this land? 
It had nothing to do, sparing a nation had nothing to do with people, with godless people, people that are not His, turning away from what they're doing. The responsibility is on us. If there's 50 righteous people, will you spare it? And then Abraham, just kind of timid, said, if there's 45 people, if there's 40 people, you notice how he, 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 he was negotiating in increments of five. And then he's like, you know what? There may not be. I need to get, a this, this, I need to get more aggressive. So he starts negotiating in increments of 10. If there are 30 righteous people, God said, yes, I'll spare the city for the, the, the nation for 30 righteous people. Well, what about if there's 20 righteous people? God said, yes, I'll spare the nation for 20 righteous people. Well, what if there's 10 righteous people in the whole land? And of course, scholars believe that's because he, he finally started thinking, well, maybe it's only Lot and his family that might be righteous. And God said, yes, I'll spare it if there are 10 righteous people. And as you know, there weren't. The secret was if Lot had just reached his own family for Christ, the whole nation would be spared. So men, how are you doing with your family? You want God's blessing in America? Stop talking about it and start doing something about it by strengthening your own family and your own home and your own house and your own marriage. He's looking for righteous people. He's looking for righteous people. Where's the church? Where are the Christians of this land? We'd like to blame the politicians, and there's plenty of blame to go around. But we sure don't look in the mirror often enough in the house of God and say that's where it has to start and get real about what does that mean and how does it look. I want to give you three things that will destroy a nation, that God says destroys a nation. Number one, sin destroys nations. We said Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Psalm 9, 17 says all the people and nations of the earth that forget God will be cast into hell. I find that unbelievably fascinating because we understand salvation and, and uh, the price Jesus paid on Calvary for our sins to be, that we can be completely forgiven, trust in Him, and have a home in heaven. We, we know the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he also said all the people and nations that forget God. That's one of the reasons why we have just made a theme out of America needs God. We have to acknowledge God once again in America. Or our, our sentence is final because he said all the people and nations that forget God will be cast into hell. Sin has a national and international impact. Sin has a national and global impact. Every nation that fell in Scripture, Damascus, Ammon, Nineveh, Sodom and Gomorrah, all of them fell for violating the moral laws of God that you find in the Ten Commandments, specifically in Commandments 5 through 10. He destroyed all nations of the earth in Genesis 6-5. And then said he would never do that again and gave the rainbow as that sign of his covenant. But he did, did not promise to not destroy individual nations from that time on. And he has done so. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for their pride, for their idleness and their abundance of food and lack of generosity with it. The Bible is very clear in Ezekiel that those were the four reasons of, of their fall. And part of it is because whenever we are, have an abundance of food, filled with arrogance and pride, and have nothing to do because life is so good and we have it so great, we end up falling into degenerate, demoralizing behavior. Nothing represents where the United States of America is better than this. Not because of the sin, but because of how comfortable, how content, how complacent we are. Number two, the second thing that destroys nations, according to God's word, corruption. 
will destroy a nation. Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31 says, Lying and false witness will destroy a nation. Proverbs 29, 4 says that bribes, taking bribes, will destroy a nation. One of the reasons I ran for president, I thought I never would, said I would never run for an office, much less this did not ever enter into my realm of possibility. Part of it's because I, I assumed, and the way the Lord was leading in other areas, I just assumed that He was going to end up having me die for Him. So when I surrendered to the Lord, I thought I was surrendering to, to die for the Lord Jesus Christ, go where He wants me to go. And sure enough, it ended up in Africa, in different parts of Africa. And we've been in the high-speed motorcades uh, on, on dirt roads where, you know, in the, in the tactical formations and at, at high rates of speed. And, you know, when you're turning through a light and you, the SUV, the motor, the engine is tapping your door in case someone tries to ram you on this side. And you turn on this side and they're t- ramming you on that side. I mean, we have been in the most amazing situations. Think 007, Jason Bourne, and then it's real life, Okay. And I mean, that is what it is like in many of these places. That's actually where they got the movie ideas from, I'm quite sure now. Uh, and, and, but we've been there. We've been in these situations. But what really did it for me was this past November, the Lord had begun the work in my heart, as I said, last August. And then in November, it was just finalized. I knew He had called me. But the catalyst for that was I found myself by myself in South Sudan. It was the first time without the delegation. At the request of the president. And we had had some private meetings in August. This was a follow-up. Takes two days to get there. I was going to be on the ground for two days and two days to get back. And as soon as I landed, through a series of events... I found myself at 11 o'clock midnight that night agreeing to say some things that would likely end in my death during my private meeting with the president the next morning. I literally negotiated how my family would be taken care of, and then I agreed to do it. Because I believed, I said, well, Lord, this is what I expected. I, I, I knew you would bring me to this place. Would I obey you to the end? And I'm ready. I'm ready. We had just found out a week before that my wife was pregnant with our first child. I said, I'm ready. And I won't go into detail for obvious reasons of I ended up being there a week on the ground. But as you can see, I'm standing before you today. When I came back, it was such a profound experience in my life. I was fasting and praying for a few days. And on that third day, I remember telling my wife, I said, God is either about to take me home or he's about to do something really great in my life. And I don't even know what that could be. I don't even know what that looks like. And it's one of the two. And it was just a few, so we cried, made sure all of our affairs were in order that day. Obviously, tell that to a a woman who's, I guess she might have been six weeks or so, I don't know the exact, pregnant at the time, two months. Not an easy time or conversation. And it was a few days later. That literally, like, <laughs> like lightning, God just impressed upon me that this is what he wanted me to do. And it was literally that simple. I want you to run for president of the United States. And of course, my response is, you've got to be kidding me. I know I'm not hearing him. I know, I know I'm not hearing him. And so th- I could not speak. I could not even talk to my wife. I could not say anything for a couple of hours. And you know what goes on in your head? Well, you start, you start with how. You, everything that you're not supposed to do, right? When you're talking, I start with the how. Well, how, how in the world that's going to work out? Well, how's my little peanut finite brain going to understand what an infant God's going to do, right? But we still ask, I still ask the question. 
Then I said, uh, but well, then, you know, look, I mean, it's going to cost $3 billion to win this next election. How, how's that going to happen? And everything I thought, I wasn't dumb enough to say it to him because I wasn't actual. I was just, but there were things that come through my mind. And what I thought of was, well, wait. When God says, when you surrender, number one, you don't get the choice of where, as a servant of the Lord, you're going to serve in His house, right? If, if, if I'm literally your servant, I don't get to, you don't even get to do it with your boss. Are you kidding me? You can't walk into your job tomorrow morning and say, uh, let me tell you what I'm going to start doing around this place. Huh? <laughs> hey, but let me tell you where you can spend the rest of your, your day, your extended vacation, unpaid. You don't do that to your boss. Well, I promise you when you're a servant, you don't do that to the master. And here I was thinking where, and I found that the struggle, the real struggle for me was I was willing to surrender to my death. It was much harder for me to surrender to obeying him in something like this. I expected to be at the bottom. After all, I was working with South Sudan, which is the most corrupt nation on earth. They're ranked 180 out of 180, more corrupt than the Ayatollah of Iran, more corrupt than, the, than Kim Jong-un of North Korea. So I felt like I was where I was supposed to be working. So to have me go the opposite direction and be the leader of the free world, how does that work? It's a tough conversation to have internally. I've got a precious, sweet wife. God, don't put her through this. Don't put our family through this. Don't put our son through this. Really? Like, this is what you're signing up for. It's ugly. It's messy. It doesn't need to be. And it's just following you. And then you read these scriptures and you find out Abraham followed God. You find out that Daniel followed God and God shut the mouths of lions. Joseph followed the Lord in obscurity. And in one day, God moved him from the prison to the palace. Second in command of the most powerful empire on earth at that time. You're either going to believe God is God or not. Either He does what He says or not. Either He governs in the affairs of man or He doesn't. He's either the same yesterday, today, and forever, or He's not. And He put that test to us. And I thought I had surrendered. And every time I surrender, I find there's other layers of surrender and more surrender and more surrender. And when you think there's no more surrender, then He says, run for president. And then you realize, oh, there was something where I didn't just say, absolutely, yes, sir. Surrender, surrender, surrender. I'm telling you, corruption will destroy a nation. What I found in my time working with these other countries was that America was more corrupt than many of the countries I was there to represent or do things for diplomatically. And the difference was we were better at corruption. If I'm sitting down at a table with you and I'm stabbing you with a knife underneath the table, slashing your legs, I mean, you've got no more legs from the knee down. I've sliced them to death. And then finally, someone who's not quite as finesse as we are hauls off and slaps us across the table for slicing their legs. And then we go, oh, I can't believe you just did that. And then the media runs with that. We just got slapped by China or Russia or Ukraine or whoever it is. And so whenever I'm at the table, when their knees are being cut off, and then I see the media literally that afternoon completely say how we're the victim in something, I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. The corruption was so deep. And I get that prior generations to me don't understand that. They grew up thinking America was holy. America could do no wrong. America didn't sin. Nobody in our government would ever do things like that. We would never kill a sitting president in 1960s. You know, we would never do things like that. And then you realize we do it every day, all the time, everywhere. What if we had someone who just governed by the book? Do right by other people. Do right 
Re- acknowledge God. Do right by other people. Do right by American citizens. Do right by other countries. Do you know there's people who love God in Russia? Do you know there's, there's Christians in China? The media likes to make boogeymen of, of countries. But we're all people. We're all humans. And I get that there's horrific regimes. Some regimes do some absolutely horrible things. Some were done earlier this year in January that I can't even speak in this public forum. Atrocities that never made our news because they would have been too graphic. Corruption will destroy a nation. And when you, by the way, when you study the fall of the Roman Empire, you'll find five reasons historians attribute to that, to the fall of that. Uh, the, the first was the rapid increase in divorce. Isn't that ironic? Like I said, the strength of the family is equal to the strength of the nation. If you, if you want me to evaluate how strong is any nation, I don't have to just look at the GDP. I don't have to look at the economics. I don't have to look at all of those things. I don't have to look at the, the military. I can look first at their social fabric of the family, and it will dictate to me how the economy is going. Because when you promote family and strengthen families, then you will have a much stronger... That is one of the best uh, weapons to securing a nation. Your best national security strategy is a strong family. But corruption. And number three, idolatry. Idolatry. So that was probably, I think, the, the fourth reason they, the historians give a tribute to the, uh, the fall of Rome, the Roman Empire, was because of their incessant love and desire, increasing need for it to be entertained. And of course, as you know, the days of the Roman Colosseum, they got, it got more aggressive, more bloody. And in our day, obviously, we idolize sports, we idolize pop culture. It consumes people. All the while, our nation is going to hell in a handbasket. Psalms. Psalm 917's words, not mine. Because we're so busy. We are so distracted that we don't even recognize what is happening in front of us. Excessive entertainment, increased taxation. The fifth reason they gave was the decay in religion, decay of religion. Number three was building up an armament of military when the threat was within, not without. Is anything sounding familiar here? I mean, it just doesn't take a rocket scientist, but if you turn on the news, you think it's all new. But it is, but God's word tells us this is what builds a nation, this is what destroys a nation. And all I can tell you is that America is doing everything according to the script of what destroys a nation. And I'm telling you, it is optional. We have the option today as believers in Jesus Christ. He said, the righteous, he will spare nations because of righteous people. But when judgment begins at the house of God, we must stand up. Government is ordained by God, just like the family and the church. Psalm 11.3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, God will abandon any nation on earth that forsakes Him. And the United States of America as an institution has forgotten God. The vast majority of people in our nation have forgotten God. A lot of Christians have forgotten God. We, they don't, the world doesn't need to hear our Sunday morning message. They need to see your, who you are on Monday morning. That's the story, not what is said. Our institutions are corrupt. They call evil good, good evil, right, wrong, wrong, right. There's no doubt our days are numbered as a nation if we do not acknowledge God in this country once again. Matthew 24, 14, we just read, is very clear. Nations will either be converted and saved or convicted and silenced. The United States, this Memorial Day, stands at a crossroads. Which will it be, America? Which will it be, dear Christian? Will you be a Samuel who goes to Jesse's house to anoint the next king of Israel? 
And then after looking over the lineup, say, he's not here. I don't know how, but he's not even on the ballot. Where is he? You have to have discernment to look at the lineup and say, he's not here. I see what you're putting in front of me. I see the entree. I see the menu. I'm telling you the next king of Israel is not here. Obviously, I don't think this coming election can be polled. I believe this 2024 election will be a referendum on God in America more than anything else. But I do find it fascinating that the, in second place in the polls right now is other. Other at 19%. That means we want somebody who we don't see in this lineup. I told Fox News, I said, it's because you haven't put me there yet. You haven't put my name for that to be an option. They, so they just have to fill it, leave it blank. Other. <laughs> but I do believe that. Because I'm here to tell you, you don't even have to be in the lineup for when God anoints you. When God calls you, you're up. Joseph didn't have to jockey and position and exalt himself and manipulate the situation in order to climb the corporate ladder to get into the second of command of Egypt. David didn't throw himself into the lineup when, when Samuel was selecting the next king of Israel. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether it be the God your father served, which were on the other side of the flood, or the God of the Amorites, and whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I like the next verse, Joshua 24, 16. Said, and the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Where are the Christians in America with that kind of fervor and passion? See, the problem with most Christians in America is that your private faith is publicly irrelevant. The evangelical vote used to be the largest voting block, and they call it the silent majority. And I remember when my campaign manager first told me, he, he said, well, well, what's your strategy? I said, well, there's 210 million professing Christians in America. 81% of America believes in God, and we don't have a politician that is real in terms of a faith in God. Uh, they, they do it like a used car salesman. They just talk about, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Well, if you're a Christian, you usually don't have to tell people. They know. So I just am not going to say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. I'm going to say America needs God because that's what really is the truth. I need Him. America needs Him. We all need Him. <laughs> and things are broken. And so I don't need to sell my resume. I need to talk about him. And I'll tell you, we need people to take a stand. Because he said, he said it'll never happen if you count on evangelicals. It'll never happen. They're the silent majority for a reason. They don't open their mouths. They're cowards. They're more interested in firing up the grill tomorrow. They're interested in going out on the lake than fighting for freedom, fighting for America, fighting for righteousness in this land. He said they're too comfortable. It'll never happen. And I said, well, I guess the only way I win is if God wins then because there'll have to be a revival in the church and he'll have to, the Holy Spirit will have to give them discernment. If I'm, their man, if I'm God's man for this, then he's going to have to give the church of the living God holy discernment. Uh, but that's the only way it'll happen. I'm telling you, though, that God has raised you up for this generation. You are alive at this time for this generation because things are the way they are. We don't lament them. We stand in the gap. He's looking for a man. He's looking for, he's looking for someone who will stand for him in this day for such a time as this. But there is hope for America yet. There is hope. God is still on the throne. He still governs in the affairs of mankind. All power in heaven and earth, he said, is in his hands. He's more powerful than the political elite. He's more powerful than the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or any party on earth. He's more powerful than those that count the ballots. He's more powerful than the United States of America and uh, the European Union, the United Nations, and all nations and institutions on this earth. There is hope in God. I say to you, we have great hope. In God, because blessed is the nation, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. It's really simple. We can have God's blessing on us once again when God is our Lord. I was interviewed by the BBC in Sri Lanka this past week, and, I, and, I, and they asked me, they said, the United States is $31.46 trillion in debt. Would you consider that God's blessing on America? 
Thank you for the trap question. No, I said, uh, I said, no, I don't consider that God's blessing on America. I consider it His mercy on America that we are not consumed yet. There is hope because blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We have great hope because He still has a remnant of people who stand for righteousness, who stand for biblical principles and policies, who stand for biblical marriage and creation, who believes that God is supposed to be in public life and government is supposed to stay out of the church. The 2024 presidential election is a referendum on God in America. He's either welcome here or He's not. And we'll either have a president that seeks Him and follows Him, or we're going to get a hasty, we're going to hasten our demise. But one thing is for certain, this world will not be recognizable 12 months from now. Everything you hear about what the current landscape is of the election, of America, of society, of the world order, I'm telling you 12 months from now, it will be unrecognizable. What usually historically has taken generations for shifts to happen have happened over, literally over the course of two to three weeks in March. Things that would normally take generations, not months, not years, not decades, generations, and they happened in two and a half weeks. The de-dollarization, I cannot, in, in all of human recorded history, it was always 30 to 50 years, even after the decline of a world empire, before anybody would go off of the standard of the previous empire's currency because it was too risky. And I'm telling you, it is already done. The plight of America is in our hands. Today is a Joshua moment. It is a matter of choice. We are the last hope for saving America. I want you to stand with me to be the light on the hill. A light that cannot be hid. A light that shines brighter the darker the sky. Stand with me in being who we ought to be so God can bless America once again. Stand with me as we lead our nation in sound wisdom in the fear of God and in the fear of the Lord. The destruction or prosperity of America is in our hands today. Hebrews 11.10 says he's looking for a nation whose builder and maker is God. We can trust God. 2 Timothy 2.19 says the foundations of God are safe and secure. I want to live in a nation built by God, don't you? I want to dwell and work and rest and play and build a business and raise a family in a nation that is built by God. Psalm 33.12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. May we be the nation. May we be the people. And may God bless each one of you. And may Almighty God shed. His grace on America once again. Thank you.